And then here, we have a fully modern person, someone who lived in Africa within the last 40,000 years, basically the same kind of skull, particularly the same kind of brain, or same shape to the, the part of the skull that contains the brain. But this is someone who behaved in a very different way than the prior person. This is someone who made a wider range of recognizable stone artifacts, made a lot of artifacts out of bone and ivory and shell, produced art. People like this would be recognizable not only in terms of their appearance, but in terms of their behavior as fully modern humans. In a sense, we're all Africans. If you took a bunch of human babies from anywhere around the world, from Australia, New Guinea, Africa, Europe, and scrambled the babies at birth and brought them up in any society, they'd all be able to learn the same languages, learn how to count, learn how to use computers, learn how to make, to make and use tools. And it suggests that the distinctively human parts of our intelligence were in place before uh, our ancestors split off into the different continents. After leaving Africa some 60,000 years ago, this fully modern species headed east into Asia, and even to Australia. Others followed the coast of the Mediterranean, north, dispersing into the hills, and leaving behind evidence that their minds were unique. Here in Turkey, Mary Steiner and Steve Kuhn have been excavating a home that these early immigrants occupied. A cave called Uchazla, one of the earliest modern human living sites. We're standing in the extreme back of the cave here, and there's been a variety of activities that took place in this part of the site. At a somewhat higher level than the one we're excavating about here, there was a structure, a, a kind of wall of stones that delimited, delimited what we think was a bedding area. A little lower down, what you see is this triangular shape, which is basically a cone of debris, and this was a garbage dump. There's this white material, which is ash, and this sort of yellowish, ashy sediment, and every single one of these white specks is a bone or an artifact. This is just chock full of material. It's a garbage dump. Now, that may not seem very romantic, but as an archaeologist, it's a wonderful thing because garbage is full of evidence about how people lived and what they ate, what they did, how they made their tools. The team hoped they would unearth clues to the routine of life 40,000 years ago. They were in for a surprise. Very quickly after we began excavation here, we realized that we had uh, something truly extraordinary. As soon as we started digging into the sediments, we started finding lots of ornaments. Mostly shell beads, but a variety of other kinds of things. They look like teeth when you first encounter them, and my heart rate goes up, and I think, more human fossils. Yep. Yet another. Just Nisarius. Oh, yeah, it's pretty, yeah, that's Nisarius. And it's got the little it's hole the in it. It's local species here. It's definitely perforated. Oh, yeah. This one's in very good condition, too, even some of the original color of the shell. It's tremendously exciting and sort of daunting because nobody had reported these before from this part of the world. And the, your first thought is, what did I do wrong? You know, to... <laughs> As they worked the layers of sediment, they began finding beads that dated back 43,000 years, making them the oldest beads found anywhere in the world. Now we have nearly a thousand ornaments, mostly shell beads of a variety of species, but also things like the claw of a large raptor or large predatory bird that's been notched to be suspended in a sort of necklace fashion. They're always selecting the same species. This is an animal that's relatively rare on beaches, but nonetheless does occur in the area. And uh, uniformly, people selected these. You can see also that they've been artificially perforated by a person, so in order that they could be suspended. For the first time in the Upper Paleolithic, people found it necessary in some areas to say things about themselves using durable material items. Durable items like beads are of no use for hunting, gathering, or protection. They suggest that those who lived here had more on their minds than simple survival. So why were these beads so important? And what can they tell us about the early days of modern humans? 
beads and artifacts have been found along the routes our ancestors took. 43,000 years ago, humans had spread north to Eastern Europe. Then they moved into the Russian plain and Central Europe. By the time they settled in Western Europe, 38,000 years ago, they were not just making beads, they were mass producing them. In southern France, Randy White has been scrutinizing these ancient beads. With powerful magnification, he can tell just how they were made. And he can reproduce prehistoric bead-making techniques. If I were to give you a piece of soapstone or a piece of mammoth ivory, and I were to ask you to put a hole in it, I know exactly how you'd do it. You'd drill a hole in it, you'd turn it, you'd rotate it to, to make a hole. But you know what? That's part of our culture, believe it or not. That's the way we've learned how to do things. Early modern human people had a completely different technique for making holes. They did it as I'm doing. They actually dug a hole into a piece of material at a very early stage of production. And it leaves some pretty ugly traces. But because the process is one by which you grind and you polish afterwards, they were able to remove all of those ugly traces and to leave behind the tiniest of little openings. I've got a hole. A very, very, very tiny little hole that I've opened up using a very, very large point. It's actually a very emotional experience to be sitting here having finished a, a bead using exactly the same techniques that people did 35,000 years ago with exactly the same raw materials that people used 35,000 years ago in exactly the same form, in exactly the same place. We have from this rock shelter more than a thousand beads like this. We know that someone who was mentally, emotionally, very much like ourselves, sat somewhere in this vicinity 35,000 years ago and made exactly what I've just made for you. People have tended to look at beads and suggest that uh, people were just sort of playing around. But in fact, we know that here at Castelmerle, they were spending thousands of hours making beads when they could have been doing other things that we might think to be more productive. Beads are artifacts of the mind's big bang. They are evidence of our creative and cultural beginnings, recalling a time when bands of humans began interacting socially with one another. Expression in materials is really uh, one of the hallmarks of, of the revolution, if you will. This is something really new on the horizon. This is people creating social identities that don't exist in nature. This is saying, uh, I am a Cro-Magnon woman. Uh, I've given birth. Uh, I have a particular history. I have a particular status within my group. And anyone who's a member of that group will be able to see that at, at a glance by the fact that she's wearing certain kinds of animal teeth, certain kinds of beads, her clothing is decorated in certain ways. Uh, it's a mode of visual expression, but it's expressing social relationships. And I think that's something clearly that's very new in human evolution. Humans using technology in the service of social identity. This was momentous. The birth of the human mind occurred in Africa and left its mark as far away as Australia. But the evidence is most abundant in Europe. It was here that these humans encountered another species of hominid, a species almost identical to them, but not quite. And it was this subtle difference that influenced who survived. We call these ancient Europeans Neanderthals. Compared to us, they were massive. Meeting face to face a, a Neanderthal would be quite an impressive experience. They had a very large body mass, some 200 pounds of muscles and bones for a male. The face is very projected forward in its, in its middle part with almost no cheeks and a receding uh, chin and forehead. And in the middle of this face, there was probably a huge and projecting nose. 